525. 525. Psalm number 405, number 405. Imitation Psalms will not be number 256. Number 256.
Good evening, brethren. Good to see everybody's come out. We're glad that you're here. If you have your Bibles, you may want to take a look with me at Psalm, or excuse me, Song of Solomon. A Song of Solomon. Uh, 5 at verse 3 it says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? That's exactly what I've done, and so I don't want to break, break Scripture, so I'm going to keep that bad boy off tonight. But uh, how is it that we always seem to be so fortunate to pick out the hottest week of the year to go to Bible camp? Well, I'll tell you what, it's going to be fun, and uh, can't wait to get out there and uh, die in the heat. No. I uh, put out some schedules. This is a few. There's 12 of them out there. There are schedules. If you want to know what your child's going to be doing all week long, Monday's a little different than uh, uh, Tuesday through Friday, but I put out some schedules out there, and that'll give you a day-by-day, hour-by-hour thing that we're going through, and the one thing I'd like to press upon you is notice how much uh, Bible, how much time is spent in Bible class. Now, there's a lot of time for extracurricular. There's a lot of time for play and so forth in the afternoons uh, when it's nice and cool, (laughs) but then at night, you know, they have some things after the evening worship, but uh, it's a real good time, and so I, you know, if you want that, uh, you're more than welcome. There's several copies of it back there in the back. I recommend that you get one, and that way you'll know... uh, when little Susie or little Johnny is supposed to call you, uh, there's a certain time they're supposed to do that. So tonight, I wanted to begin things off by talking about something I mentioned this morning, but couldn't uh, think of the name. And the name is Halal, and that is the, uh, what, uh, now the Muslims are divided on this, but, uh, you know, you have some that say that, uh, but the majority of Muslims, I believe, would say that, you know, the animal needs to be killed in in a halal fashion, or which just simply means clean. And that is that the name of Allah is, uh, you know, pronounced when the animal is slain. Certain particular ways they have to be killed and so forth. Uh, and that was, and that's what I was talking about. This is going to become more popular as we become more, uh, you know, uh, multi-ethnicity in, in this country and so forth. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've never, we've always looked at 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the book of Romans, chapter 14, 1 Corinthians, uh, of course, chapter 6, and, and talking about the eating of meats and stuff, and we thought, well, what does that mean if it's sacrificed to idols? You know, that's not, you know, an animal's an animal. Well, here, here's a situation where you're going to find yourself maybe someplace in a marketplace and, and given that same thing. Now, you know as well as I do, that's ground beef right there, and it looks like, well, I couldn't even tell you what that other stuff is, but, you know, it's meat. It's a part of an animal that's been cut up, and, uh, you know, ask not and don't tell is basically what Paul says to, and, uh, but if it's a matter of faith, then, of course, don't eat. But I wanted to you show you that just so you'd know that uh, what that word was. And you'll see that more and more often uh, in the future, I do believe. One of the great evidences of the Bible, of course, is creation. You can take a look at the Milky Way and the millions of stars of which our sun happens to be one that, that are a part of that great Milky Way in which we're a part of. And you can think about the firmament. You know, you can think about the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalms chapter 19, some folks like to look at the sun and talk about how powerful this thing is, how quickly it's burning up, yet it's going to be billions of years before it'll be completely extinguished. Some folks look at the, at the planets, our solar system, and I thought this was kind of cool. This is one I found online, and notice Pluto's still a planet. Uh, I've got a clean comedian I like to listen to, and one of his jokes is that he gave up on science uh, when he failed or missed one of the planets, and it was Pluto. And then come to find out it wasn't even a planet, so he should have went back to the fourth grade and got his grade changed, you know. But uh, people look at that and the clockwork and how that always is the same. And they think of uh, the, the creation, and rightly, rightfully so, our earth, and how it's tilted at 27 degrees to give us the seasons that we have, how it's spinning at 1,000 miles per hour over, and something like 10,000 miles an hour going around the sun. Uh, and look at all of that and say, you know, the hand of God is in that. And I think that's a good thing. The Bible talks about that. We wouldn't know much about salvation or the Savior or the, you know, uh, scheme of redemption or anything just through creation. And so, uh, but the creation is definitely a powerful argument for the existence of God. But I think the Bible, too, is a great argument for just the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible's a good argument for itself. Written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different men, all pointing towards the same thing, and that being the Christ from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, no book has ever been produced. There's no series of antiquated writings that we can look at and even compare to the Bible. Homer's Iliad and so forth to that nature doesn't, doesn't hold a candle 
to the scriptures and uh, just the uh, idea that something could have been put together and be so old and yet uh, have some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Because I think another powerful argument for the Bible being the inspired word of God, for the Bible to be something that we need to study, for God's word to be true is the idea of types, antitypes, shadows, or as sometimes they're called pictures. And we're going to look at pictures in the book of Numbers. Now, I used to love it when, you know, pictures were numbers or numbers were pictures. This was when I was excelling in math. I could really get a hold of it. I knew if I had four peaches and you took three of them away, I only had one left. I was all over that. Same thing with pineapples and oranges. But when they changed from, uh, you know, fruit to numbers, I got, I got in trouble. But I understand that, and that's what we're going to be looking at. But I want you to notice 1 Peter 3.21. It says the like figure. Now that's a word, a Greek word, tupos. It means the idea of a pattern. Paul would say, but uh, thanks be to God that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, the same word. Notice Peter says the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Notice <clears throat> many lessons have been preached. And we'll look at this uh, chart here again a little bit. But many lessons have been preached and talking about the ark being a type of the church. Well, that's not what this passage says. Now, there's a lot that you could draw inference from about the ark, how that salvation was in the ark. If you weren't in the ark, you were going to be lost, and, you know, salvation's in the church. And if you're not going to be in the church, you're going to be lost. But that's not what Peter's talking about. See the, the type that he gives us. And that's one of the things when you're looking at types or shadows or figures, and when the Bible says this is a type of something, then we need to let that be the answer. That needs to solve that once and for all. Notice what he says. The figure here, the type, is that baptism also now saves us, just like in the ark in 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse 20. Now, what is the type there? The type is baptism and the ark, uh, excuse me, and water, excuse me, not the ark, but water. And that is that water saved Noah and his family as it condemned the rest of the world same is true with baptism. It saves us, separates us from the world in that when we're baptized, our sins are remiss, our sins are washed away. And notice it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards uh, God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the figure here is the water. The fact that the water saved the folks that it was an ark as it condemned the world. The fact that baptism doth also now save us, brings us out of the world and adds us unto the church. So when a type is given, let the Bible be consistent with that. One of the troubles you'll get into types and shadows is that sometimes the same thing with parables, and that is we try to press uh, things that just simply aren't so. And so we have to be careful with that. One of the great patterns, one of the easy things to see is the tabernacle. This is one of the, and I always like to use this when I'm talking about the inspiration of the Bible or evidences of Christianity, or evidences that the Bible is the Word of God. There is no way any man could have come up with the tabernacle as a type of the church and then delivered it as it was delivered in the book of Exodus, the book of Numbers, as it is talked about in the book of Hebrews, the New Testament, how that one was a shadow and the other was an answer to it. We know for a fact. Now, the skeptics, they can say all they want to. We know that the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, was written some 1,500 years before the Christ. But even the skeptics, even those who would argue that and say, no, it's of a modern invention, they have to admit at least that it's 300 years before the Christ. And I tell you, there's no man alive that could come up with something 300 years, 400 years before the New Testament would be written to where you would have these examples like the, the Ark, the Covenant, you know, the Tabernacle, and have the answer of it in the New Testament. What am I talking about? In the Ark of the Covenant, of course, you had the two compartments. One was larger. It was called the Holy Place. The second was called the Holy of Holies. To the east side, where that red line is there, was how you entered. Once you entered in, you had to give the priest your sacrifice. The sacrifice would give you uh, the right to go to the water, the priest the right to go to the water, where he would have to wash himself. Now, the sacrifice, of course, being a type of Christ. The, the sacrifice had to be made. The water, the laver to be washed before you could go into the holy place, which is the church, a representative of the church, a type of the church. Well, that water represents, of course, baptism inside the holy place, representative of the church. You would have the table, the showbread, where you had the six loaves and two stacks, 12 altogether with the drink offering on the table. Remember what that, of course, would represent. 
Same thing that we do today in the Lord's Supper. On the uh, <clears throat> west side, you had the altar of incense. Remember incense and the new covenant represent prayers. Uh, old, the old covenant was prayers that rise up before God. On the uh, south side, you would have the menorah, the seven a branched candlestick that would give light as the church gives light to all men. And then, of course, in the holy place, the holy of holies, where no priest was allowed to go save the high priest. Of course, Jesus Christ himself went into the actual holy of holies, not made with hands, but this was but a shadow, the Hebrew writer will say. Jesus and the new covenant went into the true holy of holies and offered up his blood once and for all, for all men. He doesn't have to go in every year on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement and give. Now that is one of the biggest and prettiest and easiest to see types of uh, the Old Testament shadow or, or something that represents something that's going to happen in the spiritual realm. And that's what we mean by types and antitypes, shadows and, and things that, that come to pass. And of course here's a breakdown of the various things we just talked about. Uh, and you can see the Holy of Holies, the curtain that separates the two, the high priest, he was one that had the, really the um and the thurman, the, also the 12 stones in his uh, vestment that he would wear. His garb was different than all the rest of the priests. The table of showbread, the altar of incense, the menorah. And then, of course, your typical priest, representative Christians. Today, we're all, we all get to enter the church. As Christians, we're all priests before the Most High God. Notice with me Hebrews 8, 5. The Hebrew writer says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the, the tupas, the pattern, the type that I have shown you, God would say. As a matter of fact, this word is used in the Old Testament when the uh, Hebrew scriptures were translated into the Greek. The Septuagint translators said, you know what? That's how we're going to translate this word right here. And they used that same word in Exodus 25, verse 40, talking about the ark. And look that thou make them after their pattern, the tupas, which was showed in thee in the mount. But the particular assignment that I've got for this Friday up at Bible Camp, and the one that we're going to look at tonight, are, is particular pictures of Jesus that we see in the book of Numbers. And you might say, well, Jesus doesn't even come around for 100, you know, 1,500 more years. What do you mean we're talking about types of? And there are several of those. And my assignment was to look at Jesus as the Passover, and the fact that he would have no broken bones, the fiery serpent, uh, Moses as a type of or a shadow or a picture of Jesus, and then last but not least, the cities of refuge as a type of Jesus. So those five things are what we're going to look at this evening very briefly. First of all, the Passover. Blood is what takes away sin. Notice that Jesus says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed, notice, for the remission of sins for many for the remission of sins. Without the sacrifice of blood, there can be no removal of sins. Notice Hebrews 9, 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. But the book of Hebrews would also tell us that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, Hebrews 10. That's why it was important. That's why it was necessary that the Christ would die. Revelations 1, 5, the beginning of the book. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. What did he wash us in? His own blood. You have to have the blood. And the Passover is representative of that. Shows in the Old Testament the need for blood sacrifices. The Egyptians, they're destroyed. They're destroyed because they do not have the blood on the three doorposts. Not only do they not have the blood, but brethren, we also see the need for the blood and the way to reach it properly. Now, you could have killed all the lambs you wanted and put their blood in bowls and not put the blood upon the doorpost, and guess what would have happened that night? You would have died. You could have told the, the angel of death when he came through, hey, listen, I've got a bowl of that out front, and I mean to do that in the morning. What would have happened to you? You would have died. There was a certain way that they had to approach that blood, and that's the same way that we have to today, not by putting on our doorpost, but what God has said. We can't just come up with something that we think is right. The Paschal Lamb was in several respects a picture or type of Christ, and we're going to look at five of these. Number one, it had to be without blemish. That's one of the things that Malachi gets after Israel for. He says, you know, 400 years before the Christ, he says, you're offering up lame things, blind animals, animals with limps. You're offering them to God. 
He says, take them to your governor. See if he would appreciate them. So number one, the animal had to be without blemish. Jesus didn't have a single sin. He would even tell people, you know, if you've got a sin you want to bring to my attention, something I've done wrong, then what is it? And, of course, no man stood to condemn him. Number two, its blood, the paschal lamb, purchased redemption. You had to have that on there or you would have lost. The firstborn would have died. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, We are purged from our sins, not with gold or silver or things that are destroyed, but by the precious blood of the lamb. Number three, the lamb had to be killed in the evening. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, the day before the Passover. Same thing with the Christ. He was killed at noon, and of course it took till 6 o'clock for him to die. Killed in the evening. And number four, the Passover was to be eaten without leaven. In other words, you couldn't put any kind of leaven in the bread. That's why we have today. When we take the Lord's Supper, just as Jesus and his disciples took it in the upper room, they were celebrating a feast that was commemorating this very act where God said, purge out all the leaven. Today, as we partake of Christ, our Passover, we are to partake Christ without the leaven of malice and hypocrisy, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. And then the fifth thing, the fifth picture that we see of Christ in the Passover is that there were no bones broken. You were not to you know, destroy that lamb, break its bones, break its neck, any of that nature. The Bible says in Exodus 12, verse 46, In one house shall it be eaten. It wasn't to take half of it to somebody else's house. It needed to be done in one house. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you eat, or neither shall you break a bone thereof. Numbers 9, verse 12 says the same thing. You shall not break any bone of it. Notice what is said in John 19, at verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Now there's some allusion to that in the book of Psalms, but I think it's hard pressed to say that's what this is talking about. But as the paschal lamb, as that sacrificed lamb, as a type of the Christ, obviously this is what that's talking about. Remember, they had already broken the thieves' legs. They had done that so they could hurry up and they would die, smother quicker, quicker uh, so that they could get them off the cross before the, uh, the next day, which was the high holy day. But when they came to Jesus, if you remember, he was already dead. And one of the soldiers then took his spear and punctured his side and outflowed the water and the blood. Next, we look at the fiery serpent, another type of the Christ. We've uh, spent quite a bit of time with this over the past few months. Remember in verse 4 of this same chapter, the people got upset because of the way. And they started murmuring. And not only did they get upset about the way they were having to go, but they started thinking about all the other stuff they didn't like. They didn't like the bread. They didn't like the way things were going. They didn't like the heat. They didn't like the water. And so they were upset about it. And so the Lord uh, sends in these serpents. And the Lord says unto Moses, when these people start dying and want to be relieved of that, he says, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. John 3, verse 14. Now remember, this is just two verses away from that great scripture that most all of us could quote, John 3 at verse 16. In that same context, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's what he's talking about. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so we see Christ and the brazen serpent. The brazen serpent, a type of the Christ. And what was the occasion of the plague or the disease? Why were people dying? Because they had turned from God. They were murmuring, they were upset, and God punishes them. Just as Isaiah says, our sins have separated us from God. And it was a punishment for sin. Numbers 21, 7, because they were murmuring, the Bible tells us that because sin came into the world, we're punished. But grace was extended. God gave man, God gave Israel an opportunity to be saved. They had to believe him, walk out, look at the serpent. They would be healed. Today, Jesus says, just as that is the case, I'll be lifted up. I'll draw all men un unto me. We have that great the, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the same idea. There was a disease, there was a sickness. That sickness for us today is sin, and Jesus Christ, of course, is the answer for that. Notice the resemblance in the remedies. The remedy was raised, the, the, the serpent on the pole. Christ was raised. The means of death, the means of death in the numbers passage, the type, was serpents running around biting everybody. The means of death today are, is sin, and Christ is our relief from that. And the means of life, the serpent was raised, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ was, our, was raised 
for us. And then we look at the remedies, the effectualness of it. There was one remedy if you got bitten by those snakes, if you wanted to live. And that was to look at that serpent. There's only one remedy today for sinners. There's only one name under heaven whereby men can be saved, Acts 4 at verse 12. The demands of faith, you had to obey. You had to go out and look at that snake. Same thing today. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You have to obey. You can't just go, uh, you know, look at something. Uh, this, we're not told to go look at the cross and be saved. Some folks want to take one passage out. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord or just have faith or just this or just that. The Bible tells us that we need to do all those things. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then God's invitation in Numbers, go look at the serpent. God's invitation today, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The invitation is Jesus' invitation, and it's extended today. So Christ and the brazen serpent, another picture that we see of Christ in the book of Numbers. Number four, Moses. You see, Moses is a type of Christ. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, at verse 18, your Bible, if you have a King James or New King James, you'll have the word prophet here capitalized. That's because those men are trying to tell you, we think this is messianic. We believe this is talking about deity, and of course they'd be right. <laughs> Moses says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. He's speaking for God. Like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now Moses says, God's going to raise up somebody just like me. He's going to be a prophet unto you, a lawgiver, if you will, a leader. Verse 19. It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. That prophet that's going to come, God says if people won't listen to him, then what? They're going to die in their sins. They are going to be lost. I am going to require it of him, God says. And so as we think about that, I want you to look at this chart with me. We think of the two great deliverers, Moses and the Old Covenant, Christ in the New Covenant. Here's the picture that's drawn, the type, the similarity. Even uh, Stephen would call Israel the church in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7, or the called out, the ecclesia. Notice that under the Mosaic economy, you had Israel who was in Egypt, the bitter land. They wanted deliverance. They prayed for deliverance. God, deliver us from this oppression and this slavery. It's amazing how quickly they forgot about that. And they would go, and as they're wandering around in the desert, they'd say, boy, we sure wish we had the leeks and the onions and uh, the flesh that we had in Egypt. We don't have anything good to eat out here. They had been griping and complaining about the bitter treatment they were having in this land of bondage, which for us as Christians today, we realize is the bondage of sin. That's where we are today in the wilderness, not in the wilderness, but in the bondage of sin. We need deliverance just as Israel of old needed deliverance. Moses delivered Israel. How did he do it? By leading them out of, and I don't know why this thing won't keep working with me here, uh, uh, leading them through the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks, that, uh, talks about that being a baptism of Moses. And Israel was led through there, and whatsoever happened to them was an example for us. Just as today, when we're in the bondage of sin, we uh, reach the um, area of uh, the church. We reach salvation, if you will, this side of heaven through the waters of baptism. We have to hear, repent, confess. We're baptized, and then we're in this, this preparatory period, if you will. It was the wilderness uh, in the Old Testament is the church today. Both of us, they are trying to get to Canaan. We're trying to get to heaven. That's the same illusion. That's the same type, shadow, that Hebrews chapter 4 makes, talking about Joshua. And notice... In the wilderness, it's a period of preparation, but they fail miserably. And you think about how many people survived the wilderness. Even the great deliverer, the lawgiver, Moses, doesn't make it out of the wilderness alive. He dies in the wilderness. Only those 20 years and below are allowed to go into Jordan, save Joshua and Caleb. It's a period of preparation, but notice everything that's provided for them. Their food, their shelter, their protection, God is there. He's taking care of them, just like today in the church. All things are provided for us. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, and the things, what's he been talking about? Clothing, food, all these things should be given unto you. All things provided, God says. 
Ephesians 22 and 21, 22 and 23, that Christ is the head. Colossians 1, 18, all things were made by him. Uh, all these things, but notice this. There's work that's involved in the church. There's work now this side of heaven. We have to be faithful to God, and that's what happens here in the wilderness. Those folks are not faithful to God. As a matter of fact, Paul will bring up the sin of Baal Peor, where Balaam, remember, who's hired by Balak, will uh, teach Balak what to do to subvert them, and he uses sex. He uses that great worship of pagan sexuality, and that's how he subverts Israel. 24,000 people die as a result of that. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to cross the Jordan to get into the promised land. Just as Christ, our deliverer, we must pass through death to get to the promised land, save, of course, the Lord's return. And, of course, our promised land is not a physical place somewhere, like in Palestine, Canaan, but our place is heaven. That's where we're trying to go. And God says, Jesus says, be faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. So Jesus is, or Moses is a type of Jesus and a picture of the deliverer, the great lawgiver. Remember, both are lawgivers. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we come to the cities of refuge. Now, this is probably something that I'd say most of us are not as familiar with as we are other, other things. There were some 48 cities that were given to Israel, given to the Levites, if you will. Six of these, uh, three on the east side and three on the west side of the Jordan River, are what we call, these six cities are called cities of refuge. Now, the reason you had these cities, let's say me and Robbie go out and we're cutting some firewood. Uh, we ain't got his really cool chainsaw. All we got some of those, you know, axes that you put on a, an axe handle. You know, you kind of slide it down with go so far. Now, I don't know about you. But I have been guilty of using some axe handles that probably should have been thrown away years ago and made firewood out of. I've even seen people, and I have used a couple, had nails driven in them just kind of help keep the head on there. <clears throat> probably shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> but the idea is, me and him are out there whacking away at this wood and this axe, you know. And lo and behold, we mess up, and that axe handle flies off, or the axe head flies off, and somehow or another kills one of us. Under the old covenant, you had a situation where the next of kin was responsible for avenging the blood, if you will. But in this situation, it's obvious that it was an accident. And in a situation like that, in order to escape the one, the next of kin, the one who would uh, take vengeance, if you will, and slay that person, the person who had killed somebody by accident, now it had to be by accident, he could go to one of these six cities, Kadesh, Shechem, Hebron, Bezer, Ramoth, or Golan. All of these were cities of refuge. And once he went in those gates, he was basically in prison. He was in prison until the high priest who was in Jerusalem died. With my luck, if that happened, I'd killed poor old Rob there with an axe head. I'd have got to one of these cities and they'd have put an 18-year-old as the, you know, high priest. That'd be my luck. But you had to stay there until he perished. Once he perished, you could leave and you all was forgotten. The avenger... <coughs> could not kill you. And so the idea was to stay in the city. And once, you know, we, we've used that in these places of refuge. Uh, in the ark was a place of refuge. You stayed in the house during the Passover where the blood was. That was a refuge. Paul would say in Acts 27, 31, that they had to stay in the ship or there'd be a loss of life. And so uh, remember when they have the big shipwreck. And here we are. You've got to stay in this city or you're going to be in trouble. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. Just as the avenger of death could not go to one of those cities and demand that I come out because I'd killed uh, his brother or something, uh, they couldn't do that. Just today, Christ is our refuge. He keeps us safe. Even though we're sinners, Christ is our refuge. Notice six, chapter 6, verse 18 of Hebrews, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before. That hope, by the way, in the context of this through verse 20 is the Christ. Christ is our refuge, and that's who we can go to today. Even though we are worthy of death, we're all sinners, and the wages of sin is death. We can go to Christ. He is our refuge, and just as those cities of refuge, refuge represented the fact we could be safe when we had done something that uh, was not good, 
but in this case wasn't you know out and out murder uh, Jesus is our refuge notice first John chapter 1 and verse 7 says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin and go on in chapter 2 and he'll say my little children these things I write unto you that you sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate one that speaks for the, uh, speaks for us with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation. This word propitiation is an interesting word in the Greek. It's the same word that's translated a mercy seat in the book of Hebrews. You're going, what? The idea behind this word is a covering. In other words, separates us from the wrath of God and the law, if you will. The justice of God, the law, the Jesus is the separation, the mercy seat, just as you had in the Ark of the Covenant that we looked at in the tabernacle. That's what this same word is translated. He is our propitiation. He is our propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but for the whole world. If anybody's going to be saved, they're going to be saved through the Christ. And hereby that we do know him. How? If we keep his commandments. Notice there's conditions. You've got to remain in the Christ. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is the liar, the truth's not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby... Know we that we are in him. There's a story in 2 Samuel that teaches a fine lesson here that I think we could draw some conclusions on. There was a young man by the name of Asahel. Now, this dude could run like the wind. I mean, he was quick as a gazelle, the Bible would describe. He could absolutely fly. But he was a young man and overzealous. It just so happened that Abner was the leader of the northern armies. Joab was the leader of the southern armies. Now, Asahel is Joab's younger brother. And these two great generals are fighting. These are men of war. You didn't try to get around them if you were on the opposite team. They would kill you. They were very skilled in combat. It's what they had done their entire life. They were very good at it. Just so happens Joab's army <coughs> routes Abner's army one day. So, you know, if the case is you run. Well, if you killed somebody back in the day, you got to keep their stuff. And I think that Asahel thought it would be mighty cool to be able to say, hey, this is General Abner's army. And so he takes off after Abner. And Abner tells him, says, is that you, Asahel, you know, the brother of Joab? He says, it's me. He says, won't you quit chasing me now? He says, I don't want to kill you. He says, won't you turn and grab one of these other fellows and, you know, kill them, keep their stuff. But you don't want to chase me. He says, I'll kill you. Asahel wouldn't listen to him. Well, sure enough, Abner turns and, of course, kills Asahel. Well, now, Joab considers it his responsibility to kill Abner, and of course, under the old law, it was. But Abner is going to, we're going to find out. Notice, and when Abner was returned to Hebron, remember those six cities? What was the one real close to Jerusalem where he'd been to talk to David? Hebron. That's where he was. Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. Remember now, they're in the gate. They're not in the city. What's Joab done? He's called Abner to come out. He wants to talk to him. And smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. We jump on down to verse 33, and David is so upset. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool died. In other words, if Abner had stayed in that city, he wouldn't have had to perish. But he, he trusted Joab. He was trying to make peace with the southern kingdom. Him and David had already struck a deal. That was the way it was going to be. There was going to be peace in the land. And what does Joab do? He jeopardizes the peace of the entire nation by handling a blood feud that wasn't supposed to do. And notice G, uh, David goes on and says, Thy hands were not bound. In other words, he hadn't been to trial. He wasn't like you see those guys in courts. You know, they're all chained up and they're bringing them in there. And it wasn't that. He hadn't been convicted. He had, he had killed a man in war. Now, friends, that's about as innocent as you can get as far as murder goes. It was combat. David says, Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. David wanted everybody to understand that he was not the one that sent Joab. Joab did this on his own. And in doing this, he was trying to keep peace in a kingdom that was very, very unstable at the time. What's the point? He had to stay in the ark. If you'd have tried to go swimming a couple of days after that started, you'd been in trouble. Salvation was in the ark. In the house, Exodus 12, 22, in the Passover, you had better be in the house where the doorposts are painted or when the angel came through, you would have been killed. 
Paul says we must remain in the ship. If we don't remain in the ship, we'll all perish. And here in the book of Numbers, we see we have to stay in the city. And Abner, of course, did not And that teaches a lesson for us. And that lesson is that even though I've obeyed the gospel, even though I'm a Christian, I must remain faithful. I must stay in the Christ. And that takes effort upon my part. Remember what Jesus said, Revelations 2 at verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We looked at the five pictures of Jesus that we see in the book of Numbers, the Passover, no broken bones, the fiery serpent, Moses, and last but not least, the cities of refuge. It's these kind of things that you can see and, and that are brought over, these types that just could not have been made up. Nobody could have made these up and then 400 years later uh, made up an entire uh, New Testament worship system, uh, and even with a Christ and 12 apostles to go out into all the world and perform all these miracles and it not be from God. It just absolutely cannot happen. When I look at lessons like this, it just helps build my faith and help me to realize that all this stuff that's going on right now has been going on for a long time. Maybe it's in my backyard now, and I'm not used to that, and it's making me uncomfortable. That's okay. It's been in somebody else's backyard. There's no temptation taking us, but it's not common to man. Somebody else has had to deal with this. Somebody's had to deal with this. There'll be other things we'll have to deal with. This isn't going to be over. It ain't going to be. We're not promised a utopia here on earth, friends. But look at this. There's no way that the Bible cannot be the Word of God. There's no way. When we look out at the creation, that this could have just been an accident, that uh, somehow dirt started creating things. You know, that's all the choice we have. Either we are involved from a monkey or there's a God in heaven. Now, friends, uh, as we said a few days ago, commenting on one of our members' posts, there's millions of monkeys running around. There's billions of people. But where's all these other things in between? They're not there. The fossil record that we were told 100 years ago, why when we start digging this stuff up, we'll find cro magnon Man and all these other things we've made up. They're not there. The fossil record does not bear out the mutations from an ape to a man that we're told to buy into. We've only got two explanations. Either dirt, either we're just lucky dirt, or there's a God in heaven. Let me encourage you to believe that there's a God in heaven, and not only that, but his son, came to this earth to die for our sins so that you and I, in this soul preparatory place, manufacture of souls, that's what we do now. We show God in this life if we're going to be faithful to him. We're going to show God in this life if we love him. That's what this area, that's what this was created for, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Didn't have to be there. It was there. Why? Soul building, a test. Just as me and you are here now, being tested, building our souls. That's one of the things that's uh, hard to do. It takes a lot of it. You know, the Bible says that cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's a, it takes intestinal fortitude. It takes strength. It takes determination to get up every day and remember that you're a child of God and that we're created in God's image and be what God would have you to be. If you're here this evening, we can help you at all. We encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.